not the time to start again, but we'll just wait for the last few that are out on the start. Uh, at your sample. 
Another way, of course, is to lose neutrons to reflectivity losses. And we have supermirrors that should make this easier to avoid, where we vary the spacing between layers, mostly of nickel titanium, to get what, what is basically drag peaks up until some critical angle. And of course we describe this with the M value, which is the critical angle of the mirror over the critical angle of pure nickel. Uh, in MaxLabs we have the uh, analytical model uh, of this behavior. And it's a bit long, but very simple. It corresponds to uh, a flat piece uh, is with total reflectivity, where we have the reflectivity R0, usually 99%. And then when we go above n equals 1, there is a, a slope which has the slope of alpha, until we reach uh, a cutoff, which uh, and the width of this cutoff is adjusted with the W parameter. And so we just need to set this. QC, R0, W, and alpha, four parameters <coughs> to describe uh, your new mirror's reflectivity. We also have another sort of hidden model in that. If you set both the alpha and W to zero, then they will, we will use a second order model that's fitted to some perhaps a little old data um, but you, you get this curved behavior that, that has been the case for a long time with superheroes. Currently, I would probably use this model to describe modern supermirrors because they have a, a, a very flat or a very constant slope, but older mirrors might need a uh, second order term. It's, however, a bit easier to use this because you don't need to set either alpha or w. Those are done automatically. Now for a bit of uh, information on, on placement. And of course, the, the little strange thing is that the origin of the coordinate system of a guide component is in MaxTest is at the start of the guide. And I, it makes it a lot easier to make the focusing of the source to the guide correct. So that part is easier. But then you probably also like to set things closely to the end of the guide, for example the next guide piece or monitor. So I would recommend that you always place an arm component at the end of your guide. Simply place it uh, a distance of A, if A is the length of the guide away, in relative to the guide, and then you can use this arm uh, as your reference for later components. That makes it a lot easier to work with this kind of system. And now for some of the most popular guide components. I very much like to use uh, the guide gravity component. Of course, gravity is an important effect in guide systems, especially for very high wavelength or very long guides. So if you can, try to use components that support gravity. And it, it's usually a very simple uh, use of this component. It just has a width and a height at the entrance, and a width and a height at the exit, and then a length. But it, you can set those independently, of course, and, and get some funny shape. And you can use this to, to set many of them together to create another more complicated shape, for example, a tapered elliptical guide. It actually also features uh, channels in the guide if you want to have a, a bender type, or uh, it can even become a Fermi chopper, which is a little strange, but a possible use of this component. Here is an example of uh, the output of the simple guide gravity. You get 
a, uh, if you have a large enough moderator that is, you get a nice even position and a homogeneous but rather small divergence. And this is um, this is the reason for the popularity of the simple straight guide. It, it provides a nice homogeneous beam at the end. We still see some of these lines here in the phase space. This is the position divergence monitor. And there, because the beam is sort of folded in on itself many times, like when you do a dough, um, and, and that, that does show up as these tiny correlations. But luckily, they don't show up in the data because they're, they're so small. But they are there. Then the wavelength is a bit difficult to see, but we try this trick yet. Yeah. Uh, there is some non-trivial shape of, of the transmission as a function of wavelength, and this is partly because of gravity. Uh, it is a homogeneous source. Right? But of course, this is also somewhat uh, an indication of the mirror quality of the guy. <coughs> then we have elliptic guy gravity, which does what it says on the tin. You, in principle, you define a ball in it, but you only simulate a certain part of it. And the coordinate system starts at the start of the part of the ellipse that you actually do simulate. Then you have to specify the length, easy enough, but then you also have to specify the focal points of your ellipse. And you do that independently for the horizontal and vertical direction. So here we have the focal point before the guy, and we say length to in and x and, and y, and then we have the focal point at the other end, and that's the length to the outgoing focal point. That's the, the logic behind these. And then we also need to define some dimensions the x width and the y height. And we can choose to do that at several locations. For example, we can set it at entrance. That's very easy for when you're doing the focus from your source to make sure you illuminate the entire entrance. But we can also set these dimensions at to the mid. Then that's the mid of the midpoint of the full ellipse and it corresponds to the small axis of the ellipse. Or we can set it at the exit. So the x width and y height, they correspond to different points of the ellipse, depending on how you set this dimensions at. And here is an example of what typical output from this component would be. And we have a, uh, a less homogeneous position, but a higher focal. Um, a, a smaller focal spot. It's still a large source, so it's not a, a perfect focusing device. It's still multiple reflections in there, but it is um, a more Gaussian beam. And then we get, in the opposite sense, we get a flatter divergent, <coughs> excuse me, a, a flatter divergence distribution, where we had a, a more Gaussian divergence distribution with the straight guy. And we also see a very different look in the position divergence correlation in the phase space. We see a very nice area in the middle, but then we get some of these tears at the very edges that are very normal for electrical guides. And they, they usually extend into this section, but they become incredibly small. So you need a very high resolution monitor to see these issues. But if you, if you bump it up to 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, you can see some of these continuing in, in many cases. And then again, the wavelength uh, is, is much the same. It's still gravity and mirror quality that, uh, that, that limit this transmission function. And if we try to, uh, to compare the two, show the difference directly. 
Here is the guide gravity and the elliptic guide gravity. And we see this, the differences, and this is the same size models as before. You can get a lot more divergence through with the elliptical, and you get a narrower beam. Then a few words on breaking line of sight. Of course, horrible, dangerous things are going on at the at a neutron moderator or source that we don't want to be able to, to see directly from our uh, instrument patch. So it's usually a good idea to bend the guide in some way. And it can be it's typically done in one of two ways. Either with a smoothly curved guide, like this section here. This is what's known as an, as an S section. But it can also be done by just changing the angle of, of the next guide piece by a rather large amount in a, in a fairly discontinuous fashion. And it, it works surprisingly well, especially if you have an elliptic section in the front because it can deliver a very large divergence. And basically you're just using one part of the divergent space that this first guy delivers to in the second guy. And so this can be another way of escaping line of sight and to be uh, investigated. And then how do you program these things in MaxDAS? Well, the, the most flexible way is actually just to insert many small straight guide elements with something like half a meter, one meter, or two meter length. But be very mindful uh, of these gaps between the guides because if the components overlap like this any neutron that enters in the bottom half will say oh I need to travel a little bit back in time in order to get into the next component so I will just be absorbed and removed while up in the top they can still go through so you won't see that the guy completely fails if you do this there'll still be a little bit of neutrons coming through but it won't be the correct result so be very mindful of this mm -hmm. they need to have space all the way through so there will be a little gap at the top usually not very important uh, and then they might just about touch uh, at the base and um, I have a dedicated guide optimization talk later in the week, I think it's Thursday afternoon and here I just have a, a little teaser from what kind of uh, optimization results we can get if we use numerical optimizers in these kinds of problems and then we can get uh, high performance guides uh, and indeed a lot of optic systems have been designed using MaxDAS um, for many instruments around the world but now it's time for you to design uh, a small guide system in the exercise where you will add uh, a guide element between your slits, so to say, or instead of your slits and use the same monitors as before and see how such a guide system will, will change your results. Uh, I encourage you to play with the parameters and see how the mirror quality affects it, how the length of the guide affects the results. Uh, and if you have extra time at the end, you can try to uh, do a, a small scan of the length parameter. If you can insert a length parameter of your guide in your instrument, and then that is shown in the solution if you are uncertain how to do that. Uh, and of course, we'll be around to help you.